and action. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Show and Tell. I am Billy, and if it's Sunday, this must be, I don't know, my time to talk to you. So let me get my gloves off because it's much easier for me to work without them. Since my last episode, I've had quite a few new subscribers. So let me take this opportunity to say, welcome in. Thank you for joining me. I hope that you will find this podcast interesting. I talk a lot about vintage styling, particularly hand knit sweaters and other garments. And from time to time, I bring on guests. You're going to see a guest later in this episode. Sometimes they're from faraway places and they each have a unique story to tell. So again, if it's your first time, I want you to have a little bit of lay of the land. Uh, let's talk about the sweater that I'm wearing, shall we? Well, actually before the sweater, my necklace. This is from the 1980s. It's something that I picked up in France. This is horn and it's clasped to the leather with some crystals. And these are lucite. Let me put these closer to the screen so you can see them better. I have these in other colors. I used to import costume jewelry, so I have quite an array. Um, I have these in black with clear stone. I have clear with clear stone, but this one happens to have a pink, like a multicolored pink stone in it. So I thought that would pick up the pink in my sweater. So I also wanted to show you this bracelet. So I'll insert a still picture here so you can really see how pretty it is. This sweater I knit after I left my corporate job back in the 80s. And I had a little more time on my hand as I was starting my business, my own business, and fell into the local yarn shop. I still have the ball band of the yarn that I used called Orient Express because it's part silk, 53% acrylic, 47% silk. I've been wearing this sweater since 1983. No pilling, wash is great. I hand wash, of course. Um, and you'll see there are bobbles everywhere, all the way down both sleeves and yeah, the back. So this was a time consuming thing to knit, but you know, if you want something that's really unique, you gotta do the time. I still have my pattern. Remember when we got patterns like this instead of online. And there was a diagram, actually, chart. Oh yeah, three colors and very interesting concept that you always have the three colors, the opposite colors in the, in the band of where you're working. So it's never, like pink on pink, it's always on the opposite colorways. So while we're on this topic of styling sweaters, I wanna just give you a little insight into 
how I think, how I work. I'm putting together my next project. So first, let me give a shout out to Michelle Mark, who was my guest on episode seven. She was very, very sweet to send me a gift, which of course she didn't have to. The gift happened to arrive on my birthday. So I consider this a birthday gift. Thank you, Michelle. This gift, the inspiration for my next project. I had mentioned that I was interested in Mary Maxim and she went and she found me this vintage pattern from the fifties. It's the child's version. A similar sweater exists in the adult size, but it didn't have this motif. And you might recall, actually, let me get it up on my screen. Hold on. Okay, so this is the American actress, Julie Ann Moore, as captured by me on a screenshot. I was watching this film on my computer called Shipping News with her and Kevin Spacey. And I saw her wearing this sweater and I, I thought it was adorable. I think I've told this story before. Um, this is one image. Let me grab a couple other images. Okay, here's another one where you can see the horse head on the sleeve right there and these checks and the collar. Anyway, it was Michelle who pointed out to me that this is not the adult version, this is the child version and she had one and got another one so that she could give it to me. So right now I am in the process of upsizing this and I wanted to show you how I'm doing that. So let me pause again and get that on my screen. One second. So there is a software called Stitch Fiddle, stitchfiddle.com. And I created a file called Mary Maxim and I took the chart from out of here, which is a very cool thing. I'll show you in a minute. Um, but I took the chart out of here and I entered it one bit at a time into their software. And then I could sort of play with colors and fill in the colors um, that I was thinking of using. Now, let me get back to, so, the colors. You know that I'm the handbag and accessories maven. It's very important to me. So here is the handbag that I have in mind. And I wanted to coordinate something with this. I also happen to have picked up along my travels, a belt that has that same tooling, a leather belt with a little silver tip. It's hard for me to find things that fit, but this one did. And I also have a couple of Mexican silver bracelets. This one's very interesting, actually. It's called a storyteller's bracelet because if you're wearing it, you could tell a child's story. You have the guitar and the burro and the Mexican hat with the cactus in the background, a little hacienda, and the little man. Hombre, um. I don't know how you say that in Spanish, but man and house. Now, you know I'm a little bit of a jewelry maven, so I don't know how many of you have seen a jeweler's loop. If you've ever been to a jeweler, he looks through to inspect your diamonds and so forth. So having one of these is a really great thing if you're a jewelry aficionado. So I can look at this and I can see that this is made in Mexico 
and it has some numbers on it, which indicates that it's not really old. I, I think when there's letters and numbers, it's maybe post-1970. So TC, which I'm imagining might be someone's initials or it might stand for Tosco 225. I, I don't know, I would have to find some resource to look that up. I did not purchase that in Mexico, but my aunt, the one who knit the sequin dress back in episode three, I think that was, she bought this during her trip to Mexico. This one is probably more valuable, more famous. Let me take a look here and tell you what I see. Oh yeah, this one is Tosco. It's spelled out T-A-X-C-O. And it looks like the artist's name is Romero and it's stamped 925, which is sterling silver. That's the purity of the silver. Not 100%, but 92.5%. So knowing that I was going along those lines, I happened to be looking for at celluloid jewelry on Etsy and I came across this pin. Of the two horse heads and I thought, gee, that's exactly the right color. For this and I thought perfect gotta have the pin to pull the whole outfit together now what color yarns am i going to use i want to try and coordinate with this so let me pause again okay so here's one of the colors that i'm looking at which is kind of a peachy color and I think that's the other color. And then I thought I would pair it with either a very dark charcoal or maybe black. So the background will be the lighter peachy color and the squares will be this pumpkin and darker color, black-ish. Okay, so I, I wanted to show you this pattern because I thought it was so incredibly well engineered. So when you open it, you have one chart, you open it all the way. You can't really keep it on screen because, you know, copyright, whatever. But they have it set up that this flips. So if you're doing a raglan sleeve, it's one way. If you're doing a setting sleeve, it's a different way. I had never seen anything like that before. I thought that was fairly brilliant. So anyway, that's a little insight into how I try and get it all together. Now, I have all of these elements set up and ready to go before I'm even choosing my colors. And I think Nowadays, for me, more often than not, that's the methodology. I'm the accessories person. I get my accessories in order, and then I work my sweater around that, not the other way around. So let me take a moment to remind you that you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Billy Toy, and I'll put that on the screen. I've also started a Ravelry group called Show and Tell. And I recommend that you go over there. And if you have projects that you want to share with us, there's no way here in YouTube for you to put your pictures. But over there in Ravelry, you could put pictures of projects that you're working on. And I'd love to see them. I think other people would love to see what you're all up to also, especially if it's vintage, of course. Um, so go check that out, please. And if you're enjoying my podcast, please do me the favor of giving it thumbs up down below and don't forget to subscribe down here. 
so that you'll be notified when I'm out with a new episode. Coming up, I might have a few more episodes in quicker succession. So I'm going to try to change up my format a little bit. Um, I think that's it. So in a moment, I'm going to be back with my guest for this episode, a young woman from Germany. Stay tuned. Okay. I'm going to say good afternoon, although it's an ungodly hour in the morning for me, but um, hi, Jenny. I'd like to hi. introduce my audience to you. Can you tell us, Jenny, I know that you're in Germany, but do you want to tell us anything about what part of Germany, what region, what's near you, and um, if there's anything special in your area or somewhere within a reasonable distance that people from other parts of the world, if they were visiting, might like to see? Sure. Um, so I'm from the western part of Germany, which is uh, the county called North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, and I live in a very small, quite unremarkable town, actually, so there's not much to do for visitors there. Um, but it's rather close to Cologne, and they've got this really big cathedral, which is probably very well known. Um, but that's something which visitors definitely have to see. Um, but around here, I don't think there's anything. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. okay. So the reason that Jenny is here, Jenny, do you yourself knit? Yes, I do, but I've only taken up about a year ago, so I'm not very good just yet. Okay, but Jenny has some sweaters to show us, and there's a background story to these sweaters. There are five of them, I think? Yes. yes. So tell us how you came to find these sweaters and who knit them? <laughs> Because it's not you. No, it wasn't. So all the credit goes to my mother because uh, she made all of them in the, I guess it was the earlier 80s. So it was uh, the last years of high school for her. Uh, and back then, knitting was very, very common here, at least in Germany. Um, and also at school, virtually everybody knitted and uh, also in class in part. And that's quite interesting, I think. But it's a little hard for me to understand you. Maybe you could crank up your volume a little bit. So if I understood correctly, everyone in Germany is studying knitting in school? Um, no, not really. Just no. um, that when you were in class, you just had your knitting stuff with you. So oh. you were in classes, but yeah, exactly. Whereas you were listening to the teacher, um, you could just <gasps> do stuff with your hands. Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. so okay. That and that was acceptable? The teachers didn't yeah. object? Apparently, yes. I mean, they, of course, had to ask the teachers, but they, it was pretty much the norm back then. Um, and so, of course, my mother also had to do something with us bad time because she didn't have a very easy childhood and she wasn't allowed to go out much. Um, and so apart from studying and reading, she had to do something. And so she did, took up knitting. Um, and yeah, she made about 20 or 25 ish sweaters in these few years. Um, most of them are still at my grandma's, so I don't have them with me, but I chose the ones that I'd like to wear most and which were, I guess, the most beautiful ones. And these are the five I've got with me today. And how did you find these sweaters? Um, basically, my grandma's always always wants to give me some of the clothing she's got because she's someone who doesn't throw anything away at all. And so all her cupboards and all the boxes are full of clothing, um, which actually range from, say, her, uh, her youth, so the 50s, uh, all the way through the 80s. Um, and so I knew that there were some of the things my mum had made, and I was really interested in looking into those. So you dug through your grandmother's boxes until you found the sweaters that your mother had made? No, thankfully they were actually quite um, quite readily available in, in her closet, right at the front. Oh. I think my grandma really treasures them. <laughs> <laughs> I had this vision that they were buried treasure and that you were up in an attic and suddenly you found this treasure chest full of these hand-knit sweaters, but I was they, fantasizing. Which is very romantic, yeah. So, okay, you did mention that it was the 1980s. So I just want to put up on my screen, let me share my screen for a moment. Um, if I can figure out how to do this, share screen. I'm never so facile with this. 
Okay. So <laughs> a lot of people watching will recognize this famous celebrity, Joan Collins, who even now in her 80s still looks very smashing. But this is a photograph from about the same time that your mother was knitting. And also, <laughs> I'm revealing something about myself. I was already knitting in this time period. And the sweater that I'm wearing right now was knit in the same exact time period. My sweater, sweater is from 1983. And as long as we're on it, it's got bobbles all around, including all down the sleeves too. Anyway, this sweater that Joan Collins was wearing was so popular um, that a lot of people knit this pattern. In fact, I believe that I myself knit this one in purple. Now hers is Angora on the sleeves, two different colors of blue Angora. Angora is very, very expensive. A tiny ball, because it's from a rabbit, a tiny ball back in the 80s. I don't remember how much it was, but it was like two or three times the cost of a regular skein of yarn. So this would have been a fairly costly sweater to knit, but that lightning bolt down the front seemed to be a thing. I don't have mine anymore, which is a pity, because I used Angora in my lightning bolt and mine buttoned on the shoulder, but I believe it was knit from the same pattern that is used here. Anyway, I just wanted to set the stage for this time period because from 1981 until 1989, probably the most popular television series in America was Dynasty. And she was one of the main characters. She was the scorned ex-wife of the dashing, debonair, super wealthy uh, Blake Carrington, played by the actor John Forsyth. She was Alexis Colby, her character. But these characters were so much a part of the American culture in that time period that my mother encouraged us to name our child Blake because she wanted him to be like Blake Harrington. <laughs> anyway, let's get on to seeing your mother's sweaters and let me get out of screen share. I just kind of wanted to set the stage for that because I think some of her things have that feel. Yes, they definitely do. Um, and my mother also watched uh, this TV show uh, at times. I mean, she wasn't a fan, but she did watch it. Um, but it's not like she was inspired by them, but she bought these um, magazines by this company called Bada. Um, and they were very popular back then, apparently, and I think they're still quite big. Um, but she made mostly sweaters from um, these magazines. And the first one is actually um, this one right, right here. So um, it's in brown, and I'm sure. And that's also some Angora in there. Um, but she changed the colors <laughs> and made it into this one. Um, and what colors? <laughs> it's, it's hot pink and black? Exactly, it's very, very bright pink um, because she was very much into pink. Um, and there's not much of a story behind most of these sweaters, but she remembers that this one she also made partly in the dark because they were watching a rather um, dull film at school. Um, and so it was dark in the room, but she made this black sweater in it. That's quite interesting. As a knitter myself, <laughs> I can tell you knitting with dark colors is very, it's very tedious. It's very hard on the eyes. I would think even young eyes would still find it harder to work with a dark color like black or navy than like the sweater you're wearing or what I'm wearing, you know, lighter, brighter colors. It's really hard to see those stitches because they all kind of merge into one another. Definitely, yeah. Um, and then there's another one which is a rather light one, very summery. And again, I really love the sleeves uh, on these because they're so very much 80s or 40s. Um, and I don't quite know where this is from. Maybe there's a magazine still somewhere upstairs in the attic, but I've no idea. Um, then that one really, <laughs> that one really is like the Joan Collins look with that zigzag. Yes, exactly, the pattern. Yeah, that's true. I could see Joan Collins wearing that. 
possibly. Um, and then this one is actually the one my mum liked the most, I think. Um, and she also wore it on, she remembers on special occasions, for example, Christmas or something. Um, and it was once, uh, one of the first ones she actually made and she put little sort of beads in there. That's what I was going to, that's what I was going to ask you. I, you had sent me photographs of these, so I will put them on screen so people can have a really good look. But I myself was wondering if those were beads. Now, were the beads knit into it or were they sewn on afterwards? Do you know? Um, no, they were definitely sewn on because some of them are nearly coming, coming off now. But apparently in the original pattern, um, they were, yeah, it was pretty much the same because it looks quite similar. It's a really beautiful, beautiful it is, pattern. It is. I think and she's still, it's so mind boggling. She still has the patterns. I still have the pattern for this actually, but that's so great. I mean, some of us might like to have those patterns. <laughs> I, I could send them out if they're comprehensible because they're in German, but I could try and translate them, I guess. You can't believe what people sell on Etsy. I mean, people do take these old magazines and they photocopy oh, them and people I are selling them. them. I don't know how that works with copyright. These things are probably still under copyright. And maybe the ones that I'm seeing people selling on Etsy are out of copyright because they're older. They're not from the 80s. They're from the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So anyway, go on. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. And this is also one of my favorites because of the color, essentially. Right here, also with the same kind of sleeves again. Um, and also down here, the sleeves um, are really long and tight. And I love that because you don't find that anymore. Um, I think the pink, the pink and black one also has that kind of narrow mm -hmm. sleeve, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It does. Both of them. It's also very interesting. Every single neckline is the same. I wonder if that was just her signature neckline or if every pattern was calling for that same design. It, it was the patterns mainly because she followed them um, pretty much all the way through. However, there's also uh, one I just dug out again, which has a slightly different color. Um, oh, yes, that one's really ripped. Visible, but yeah, there are some, some of them which are a bit different, but I think that was just a style in these two years. Um, and the last one is this, I don't know whether it's called jacket pattern or something, but it's, it's quite, yeah. Oh, usually fair, usually people would call that fair aisle, I think, when oh, that's okay. you're using two or more colors on the same row. Mm -hmm. And in the background, on the reverse side, there's all those, they call them floats. They're little strands yeah. of yarn. Yeah, and I think it's really remarkable how neat these color changes all look because you can barely see them. And I know, I mean, I'm just a beginner, but I know how hard it is to get this done properly. And nowadays, my mom also has no idea anymore how she did it exactly. If <laughs> she's a bit out of practice. <laughs> well, we, we didn't really see that. You sort of whisked yeah. over that. Halt it up again, please. Sorry. That's OK. No, but the whole sweater. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Wow. She also said that probably took a fair amount of time. Um, but she loved to do something challenging, firstly because it was her main hobby. Uh, and so she couldn't just fill her water up with lots and lots of pieces. She also had limited space. Um, but also because she had to do something that was in any way challenging at all. So that was that. Wow, well, it's very admirable that she challenged herself like that. I, I'm finding more and more myself in that boat that I don't want to knit something that's just plain stockinette unless I want a palette cleanser. But I'm also trying to do, I mean, especially even this sweater from yeah. around 1983, all these baubles, it was a lot of work, but I thought I had the time um, and why not challenge myself? And then you get something that no one else has. Exactly. Um, and she had to stop, unfortunately, because first of all, because she started to move out and then go to university and that took up a lot of time again, but also because she had a really severe case of uh, neurodermatitis. And that, of course, makes knitting rather difficult. And also she couldn't wear the sweaters anymore. 
so it's quite a shame but she started a few years ago again and just the summer she finished this piece i'm actually wearing right now uh, which is based on a 40s pattern but um it's really sad you can't really see this very delicate lacy pattern it's very 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 beautiful well you could send me a picture of that and i'll include that on here and then we'll have a really good close-up it looks lovely and I, for one, am really partial now to things from the 30s and 40s. I wasn't back in the 1980s, and I took a big, long hiatus. But when I've come back to knitting, I'm finding, I guess, taste change and my style, my personal style has changed. So it seems like maybe for your mother, too. Now she's like the 20s <laughs> does Ooh. 40s. Not really. She doesn't like to wear knit, uh, knitted things still. She doesn't like it, but she makes them for, for me because I love wearing vintage. So. Ah, you do. Okay, good. Yay. <laughs> I'm glad that the younger generation, and I no longer include myself in that generation, sadly, although <laughs> somehow in my mind, I'm still fantasizing that I'm 23. But yeah. I'm glad that people your age and my son's age are kind of embracing this you know, swing dancing and poodle skirts and saddle shoes and, um, oh, there's so many things on eBay and Etsy now that are vintage. It looks like your pin might be a vintage pin, is it? Um, no, this one is actually the poppy seed for Remembrance Day on the oh. 11th of November. Um, but I thought it might, might be quite fitting still because it's a brooch in a way. Oh, well. November 11th harks back to World War One. World War One? Exactly, yeah. And it's actually a big thing um, over um, in the UK, but I think it's so important to also spread the word here in Germany because people don't really observe days like this anymore. Um, now, how is it that your English is so perfected? I wouldn't say it's perfected, but thank you. Uh, I don't know, I just watch a lot of uh, English television and uh, read English books. Um, well, that, I think it just came that works. <laughs> thank you. Well, okay. Thank you so much for sharing those with us. I look forward to getting a picture of this very pretty white one, especially since it's that's really vintage. Um, yeah, great. I'm, I'm glad that you were willing to do this. I know it was a little bit um uncomfortable because you're not the knitter but please extend my thanks to your mom and thanks for joining us thank you for having me you're welcome <laughs>